It's really good to be with you. I've been uh, praying for you guys just about every day for probably four or five months. And it's kind of cool to stand up and actually see the people that I've been praying for. It was also cool to walk around the uh, dining hall and nobody knew I was the speaker because I had the wrong face in it so I could just wander around anonymously, which was great. But now that's up. Anyway, I'm going to start with a little Shakespeare for you. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. I make my entrance now as a retreat speaker, but I have played many parts. These teaching sessions I'm going to do with you emerge from my pastoral experience. Usually when I'm preaching or teaching, I say very little about myself. But this is really doctrine wedded to experience. And uh, so I take the risk of talking about myself more than I usually do. And I do it with this uh, quote I read in mind that I thought was really good. And the writer talked about people who refuse to share the things they've learned by experience suffer from what he called inverted egotism. Let me quote what he says. Selfishness masquerading in disguise of reluctance to speak of self. He added, it is not regarded as egotism when the passing steamer signals across the Atlantic wave news of her escape from perils of iceberg or fog or welcome news of good cheer. Yet individuals shrink into themselves, repressing rigorously the fraternal instinct which binds them, communicate the fruits of their experience to their fellows. So I'm going to shun such inverted egotism and share, as Norm said, uh, the most important things, actually, that I wish I... It's not like I didn't know them, but I wish I had a firmer... I needed to have a firmer grasp on when I started the ministry. So let me give you a few snapshots of who's standing in front of you. I became a Christian in my junior year of high school on Easter Sunday, which was kind of interesting. I started college as a music major, trumpet, and uh, two years into it, a Jehovah's Witness came to my door and twisted me into a pretzel, and I thought, hmm, did they teach me to write stuff down at that Baptist church? I better look into this very seriously. And I started studying the Bible, and I got, I found out they were wrong relatively quickly, but I got hooked on really going deep in God's Word. And so I changed my direction, well, the Lord did, and went to Bible college where I met Norm and, uh, and my wife. Um, I asked her out on our first date while we watched some skunks rummage around the garbage heap. I thought it was a good moment, you know, mood was right. Um, but anyway, met a lot of people there and uh, got a, a bachelor's degree in Bible and Christian education, later a master's degree in theological studies at Wheaton College because I thought I was going to be a professor, and then the Lord, once again, put me in a different direction. My first experience teaching in any kind of structured setting, I inherited a seventh grade boys' class in Sunday school. Now, there are things I would encourage you to imitate about me, but not everything. While I was waiting for the kids to come, I noticed there was a kick panel under his stairway. Norm, you know the old, old part of that. There are three buildings, the oldest building, and it had this old building. Went to the 1800s, and I pulled the kick panel off, and it was, oh, it was a dirt floor in there, and there were spiders, and it was damp and dark. And I thought, ooh, you know, so I put the kick panel back. But I was thinking as I was waiting for the kids to come, because I had heard they were a notorious bunch when they were in sixth grade, and I thought, I got to do something about that. So when they came in, I had them look one at a time in the thing, and I closed them, and I said to them, if you give me a hard time, I'll shove you in there. <laughs> and everything worked out great after that. <laughs> as I thought later as a senior pastor, <laughs> I thought, oh, my goodness, that was crazy. But I've done many jobs before the pastorate, including cleaning houses, picking up dead animals on a highway, Cutting grass, painting, jackhammering, floating concrete. I had three delivery jobs, and the first one I delivered false teeth to dentists. This feels like mine are slipping right now. Carried eggs to homes and restaurants. And then in the third one, delivered all kinds of things, including government forms, payroll, machine parts, wallpaper, and medical specimens to a hospital. 
I'm ordained in the Evangelical Free Church, and I served as a pastor for just shy of 40 years uh, without a break. I did four uh, senior pastorates and one interim, uh, which was a really good experience, actually. The churches I led covered a very broad spectrum. They ranged in attendance, average Sunday attendance, from 35 to 250 to 550 to 1600. I went, I've been a solo pastor with no staff at all. I've had a pastoral staff of nine pastors under me and a church staff of 25. So I've seen a broad spectrum. My favorite one was the church of 35. Seriously. So uh, I served on a denominational board. I've worked with various consultants, some national. I've had special training in leadership and governance, taught some leadership and development classes and seminars. I've written four books. Um, so all of that stuff is to say um, I bring a pretty wide experience to this role to speak to pastors and Christian workers. But I want you to know I do not come here as an expert. I come here as a sinner saved by grace who the Lord um, gave the privilege of serving as a pastor. Let me go back to the bard, Shakespeare, and as that thing I talked about before proceeds, plays many parts, he says this about man. He says, his age is being seven. At first, the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like a snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover sighing like furnace with woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Then a soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice in fair round belly with good cape unlined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on his nose and pouch on side. His youthful holes well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, try saying that one in front of a room full of people, and his big manly voice turning again toward childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound, last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history, is second childishness and mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. So you encounter me now between the ages of puking in the nursery and losing all my teeth. And I suppose if I had to plot myself on Shakespeare's ages, I would be in stage five, the justice, which some people call the sage. I, I'm working on the rounded belly. Um, I don't have severe eyes, but I do have a beard of formal cut. So here's the point of all of this. I have gained at least some wisdom, often through making mistakes. And I'm here. Um, to tell you things I couldn't have told you uh, even many years ago, things I had to really think through, things I had to really experience. The title of this set of talks is for, uh, From Green to Somewhat Sage, Wisdom Gleaned by a Long-Term Pastor. Let me give you a few points of direction, and then we'll hit the ground running on the first session. I'm operating from the standpoint that the Bible is free of error and the final authority for all matters of belief and practice. You won't have to take any notes if you don't want to. Um, you can if that helps you. But see, I know how people are, and whenever a, a speaker gives me notes, I'm always reading ahead of where he is. So I'm going to save you from that temptation. At the end of this seminar, I'm going to give you a, a, a link to a complete set of notes that will have an entire manuscript of every lesson I'm teaching you, as well as many, many supplemental notes, because the stuff that I've been thinking through in preparation for this blossomed into what might become a book. So I'm giving you access to my research up to this point. It'll be on a website for 30 days, and you can grab that. 
I, there's a lot of pages, and I figured it was better to do that than to carry 900 pages of paper here on the airplane. Um, I also just want to tell you, uh, at no point in these sessions will you be asked to rub anyone else's shoulders or fall backwards as a test of trust. What you do on your own is none of my business. Please feel free to talk to me outside the sessions, because that's where the good stuff often happens. And what I will say here applies to everyone, not just pastors. I am not, I didn't think of you all only as pastor. I'm not going to teach you how to write a sermon. I thought of a broad spectrum of Christian workers. So again, I didn't even want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a Christian. God had other plans. And if I'm sage to any degree, it is from clinging to the gospel, even when my knees shook, when my stomach churned, and when my fingers trembled. I am not here as an expert, as I said before. I'm here as a sinner saved by grace, who has striven to serve by grace, and I am here to help others do the same. So let me pray, and then we're going to look at the first session of four. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word. I thank you that, as Paul told Timothy and Titus, it is for encouraging, that's, and that's great, and I trust you will do that through it. But it's also for correcting and training, and those things are hard sometimes. And I pray that wherever we need to be corrected and trained in hard ways, we'd be open to that too. We commit this to you now. You get all the glory out of anything good that emerges here, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the first session is going to be purpose. Purpose. Let's start with the first of three very simple questions, but important ones. First, why do we exist? Why do we exist? I want you to start with a phone ringing in a pastor's office. It was my senior pastor. I was an associate pastor at the time. And I hear he answers the phone and he says, he's listen, listen, listen. And he says, toward what end? And he's quiet. Listen, listen, listen. And he says, toward what end? And he's quiet for a long time again. He says, toward what end? And then it was kind of like, well, thank you. You know, I'll let you know. And I'm sitting there, what is this? So I asked him, and he said this. A church consultant had called him to offer his services to grow his church. And he said, the purpose of the church is to reach people. And my pastor said, toward what end? Three times. And the man could not put the mission of reaching people into any bigger context. This was the first inkling I had that I didn't really have a firm grasp on some very fundamental things. God calls the church to reach people, but that cannot be the reason for the church for a very simple reason. There's going to come a point where we don't reach anybody anymore. And if that's our main purpose, we're going to be purposeless for eternity. And we're not doing any evangelism. So how could that be the main purpose? But the consultant couldn't get to that point. We must serve an end that does not end. And we're not going to be evangelizing in glory. So what are we going to be doing? And the answer, of course, if you really think about it, is worship. Worship's never going to cease. It's going to infuse all our everlasting behavior. That's our main purpose in eternity. Everything must serve that end if we're to serve God properly. The problem with saying the church exists to reach people, um, well, a problem, is it makes it sound like salvation is the most important thing in the universe. And it isn't. God is, he's not a thing, but he's the most important. And salvation is just one way to produce worship. Angels worship God and they've never been saved. They don't have a purpose. If salvation's the most important thing in the universe, the angels can't do the most important thing in the universe. Oh no, they can. They can worship God and they do. You want to hear a man pray with perspective. Missionary David Brainerd and I've been to many of the places he served, Uh, served the Delaware Indians in the early 1700s. Ponder this diary entry about prayer and outreach. 
He says, but just that night, the Lord visited me marvelously in prayer. I think my soul never was in such agony before. I felt no restraint, for the treasures of divine grace were opened to me. I wrestled for absent friends, for the ingathering of souls, for multitude of poor souls, and for many that I thought were the children of God personally in many distant places. I was in such an agony from sun half an hour high till near dark that I was all over wet with sweat. Yet it seemed to me that I had wasted away the day and had done nothing. Oh, dear Jesus, my dear Jesus did sweat blood for poor souls. I longed for more compassion toward them. I'm going to tell you this. David Rayner loved people more than I do. But he wasn't human-centered. Here's another entry about prayer from his diary. I poured out my soul for all the world, friends and enemies. My soul was concerned, not so much for souls as such, but rather for Christ's kingdom that it might appear in the world that God might be known to be God in the whole earth. He knew his purpose. And this is all over the Bible. In Isaiah 43, God tells Israel the point of salvation, saying, I, I sweep away your transgressions for my own sake. God says he judges and saves people so that they know he is the Lord. The prophet Ezekiel says that 53 times in his book. Psalm 67, too, asks God to be gracious, quote, so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. We get to the New Testament, same thing. In Romans, Paul says that he's been made a minister of Jesus Christ so that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering to God. Why did, we, why did Paul reach Gentiles? God. 2 Corinthians 5, he tells us that Jesus died so that we should no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. In Titus 2, he says Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. First Peter, you're a chosen race, so forth and so on. Why? So you can praise God. Revelation 14, I saw another angel flying high overhead with the eternal gospel to announce to the inhabitants of the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. This is outreach. He spoke with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of judgment has come. Worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. So worship Reaching people with the gospel, which the consultant was very focused on, is one great way to worship God in the present. But it will stop. And then it will be worship in many other ways. I don't know how the Lord is going to create new ways for us to worship, and perhaps in the new heavens and new earth, but they're going to be there. So what's our purpose? Worship. All right, time to go home. Not really. Because the next question is, what is worship? And that is where it starts to get real tricky. And, and my experience as a pastor showed me how tricky it can be. When I was in my green phase, I lacked a robust sense of worship's meaning. Let me, let me get at it by starting with a statement you'll hear people say. The worship in that service was wonderful. What do they mean? The music, the singing, and they don't just mean it was good. It, they used, I mean, to be fair, I'm not trying to be critical here. I'm just saying that they mean it moved them, and it made them maybe even love the Lord more, and that's all great. Um, but the problem is that shorthand is okay to a degree, but the problem is if we think worship means singing, we shortchange worship. If we think worship means emotion, we shortchange worship. None of the Bible vocabulary for worship, there's about four main words, have anything to do with music, and they don't directly have anything to do with emotion. They mean to bow, to serve, 
and to kiss. And to kiss because you would bow and kiss the feet of a ruler in that culture. So all those words really are about you adopting a humble position before the supreme ruler. And that position essentially boils down to humility. The biblical vocabulary, the main vocabulary, is really about humility. Think about that. We can't always sing, can we? But we can always be humble before God, can't we? Prideful Christians fail to worship even if they're in a church service where the music floods them with warm feelings. Obedient Christians worship even if no one sings and no emotions soar. I remember, this reminds me very much of the large church I served that had a big platform like this. And somebody said they couldn't worship in the room because there was a drum set. Nobody was even playing it at that service. It was just there. I thought, wow. So let me put the biblical vocabulary in that for you. I can't be humble before God when there's a drum set in the room. How's that work? Not well. Now, if it was an accordion, I could understand. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I have a friend who's an accordionist. I love him. No, that's, that's just... I can't be humble in a church where the music doesn't fit my tastes exactly. Not really. Some of my greatest experiences in worship have been in places where everything didn't suit my aesthetic sense. Listen, orthodoxy is indispensable. Options are not. Worship is valuing God as God. Delighting in the supremacy of God, bowing to kiss his feet, is the most uplifting thing a human can do because it, that's where we really are. That doesn't mean we're nothing. It just means we're not God. So if you bow before God, delighting in his supremacy, you have worshipped, even if you were not in a worship service. And if you have not humbled yourself before God, you have not worshipped, even if you were in a worship service. Now I want to uh, show you, if you want to turn to Revelation 2, Let's just actually eyeball on one of these, or you can just listen. Again, you're going to get all this in your notes. One day it really struck me how seriously the Lord takes our worship, especially as I've been thinking about the, um, the church exists to reach people, um, frame of reference. In Revelation 2, 4 to 5, now Jesus gives, probably most of you know, seven church assessments. We're not talking about a consultant here. We're talking about the Lord. And only two of seven get a full positive review. That's sobering. He says to Ephesus in Revelation 2, yet after he says good things about them, he says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. First love can carry the meaning either of the love you manifested back then at the beginning, or it can mean the first priority love, and there's probably overtones of both. But here's what I want you to think about. This Ephesian church had received top-notch spiritual input, like maybe no other church ever. Paul spent three years there. Priscilla and Aquila were there. Timothy was their pastor. <laughs> They had a letter to the New Testament written. That's a pretty serious investment. And yet, they're being knuckleheads here, right? Which, if they could be knuckleheads, don't underestimate your own ability. Jesus will not hide a lamp under a bushel, but he will remove a lampstand, he says right here. And I want you to think about the implications of that. They had lots of experience. They did lots of ministry, but they were drifting from God-centered church life. And Jesus says, if you don't repent, I'm going to take away your lampstand. If you take away the lampstand, what goes? Outreach. There's no more reaching people. So Jesus, in that case, prioritized 
the church being about him over the fact that they had outreach. He would take their lampstand away. I became a Christian in a church. It was a big church. And I don't know there ever was a church as outreach-oriented as they were. They reached me with the gospel, and I didn't want to be reached. And um, some years later, because there was a lot of pride and a lack of humility, which sprung up into church politics, that church, which averaged about 1,000 people every Sunday, was down to about 50. And it's been 40 years, and there's still only about 100 people there. Now, don't mistake me. A hundred humble people is better than a thousand prideful people. Well, you know what's better? A thousand humble people. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So just being outreach driven is not good enough if you're not humble. And the fact is, sometimes when churches do reach a bunch of people, or at least when the numbers go up, they're in great danger because that's when they think there's something. I'll tell you, I served, I led a giant church in most people's estimation. And there was a Walmart across the street, and they made me pay for my gum there. Like, I couldn't believe how much they didn't appreciate me. <laughs> I was the pastor of the big church. Wait, wait, wait. she gave me free stuff. You know? That's goofy. Keep this in mind. When Jesus said that to the Ephesian church, he also said in um, Revelation 2 and 3, those whom I love, I rebuke. And he loved them enough that he wasn't going to settle for them not being God-centered because he knows only he is worth being centered on. All right, I'm going to close with some implication. Am I okay? I don't even know. I didn't look what time I was because I'm not the guy in the brochure and I got all confused. Are you guys all right? You know, okay. You still awake out there? I didn't see my wife. Is that, am I okay? I'm good. All right, so um, let me give you three implications for ministry and we'll, we'll finish. It's not far. So. First, Ignore the mantra. This is what I want you to do. Ignore the mantra. Today, a lot of ministry books blame evangelical churches for being inward focused. And they offer the solution, which you have probably heard. Now, first of all, they shouldn't be inward focused. So I got no problem with that. But the solution is what? You know, if you've read any of the books, be outward focused. All right? You hear this all the time. It's the same problem. You just went in a different direction. You're still being human-focused, right? We should be upward-focused. When you're upward-focused, then you know how to handle everybody at the horizontal level. But if you're outward-focused, you could be like the church that got all prideful and political and crashed and burned. They were out, believe me, if there's ever a church outward-focused, that was it. And I have a feeling that lampstand got taken away. The church should be outward reaching for sure, but that's different than being outward focused. We need to be upward focused. You'll find some shocking statements in church growth books. And I'm not saying everything in them is bad, but some, some are shocking. Listen to this. I'm quoting directly from a church book, growth book, a popular one. He says, you, you churches, you local churches need to ask yourself this question and answer it. Why does our congregation exist? That's the question I started with, right? Why do we exist? Listen, he says this, quote, for congregations in local communities, there are only three possible answers to this question. One, this congregation exists for us, the people inside. Two, this congregation exists for others, the people outside. Three, this congregation exists for both. You notice the problem there? Yeah. They left out the fact that church exists for God. There are only three possible? You left out the factual one. We can be so focused on reaching people that we don't behave like people who have been reached with the humbling and yet uplifting gospel. So ignore the mantra, be outward focused. No. Be outward reaching, but be upward focused. Second, don't be like a business. I don't mean church leaders should not use good business practices, ignore good communication, learn nothing from the business world. I read books, I read uh, Harvard Business Review articles and all that. 
I have a fair number of such books, but too many ministry books in the last at least few decades emphasize trendy business terms, models. Some even call us to market the gospel as a product. Well, if you pitch the gospel as a product, guess how people in your church are going to spell service? S-E-R-V-E dash U-S. What you reach him with is what you reach him to. God's not a product. He's the producer. He created the world. You don't market him. Our mission is to call people to worship him in spirit and truth. David Wells says, what is to be gained if we are so intent on reaching out to the unchurched that we then unchurch the reached? If we lose focus on God, we become unchurched church folks. Here's the last one. I want you to be like the wild ones. I'm going to end this talk with, uh, you can turn if you, well, you know what, I'm going to jump through a couple passages again. Just listen, like they did in the early church. The Apostle John, in the last book of the Bible, points upward as he describes this God-given vision. And he said there was this open door, and somebody said, come up here, I'm going to show you what takes place. He sees these wildest creatures surrounding the throne and some elders. And it says this, each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy Lord God, the Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship. You see the bow down, fall down, kiss. Worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne and say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because, why? You have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. They didn't even get to salvation yet and they're just praising God because he's creator. As the angels, the righteous angels have never been saved, but they praise God because he's creator. And then they praise God because he saves us. They're not even in on it. And they're all like, wow. John sees the elders and creatures pray, and he hears their song about Christ the Lamb this way. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign on the earth. John continues. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. And they said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, on the sea and everything in them say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and Ever And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Unlike the creatures, I am not covered with eyes. But this formerly green pastor came to see more clearly that worship is the reason to exist and that it's essentially about humility before God. Do you? If you see that, what impact will it have on your ministry for the Lord. Let me pray. Thank you again, Lord, for this time. Thank you that um, these brothers and sisters paid very good attention. And I pray that you guide us in the next couple of days to really draw closer to you because that's the, that's the end goal. That's the point. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.